Uh, welcome back, everybody. I just met a bunch of cool new people, so that was exciting. Uh, so this is being recorded, since everyone just pressed that little button. Uh, and we are going to kick off our o ocean exploration uh, webinar series, series with uh, Leonard Pace. Uh, Leonard is a science program senior manager at the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Uh, and I am going to hand it over to him. He's going to talk for about 15 minutes, and then we can have some questions before Dan speaks. So take it away, Leonard. All right. I think my screen should be up and sharing. Everybody seeing it all right? Perfect. Yep. All right. Very good. Uh, as Julie said, I'm the science program manager at Schmidt Ocean Institute. I have been at SOI for 10 years. I'm really excited to be celebrating that decade anniversary this year. Uh, my primary responsibility at SOI is to manage our proposal review process. So I see all the projects uh, that come into us long before they ever sail on Falcor. The thinking that I come to this particular part of my science life is what's going to happen in two years on Falcor or Falcor 2. Um, you're looking at Falcor 2, the research vessel that we are just uh, kind of getting underway with. Uh, but that is not where we began at SOI. Um, we've been operating since 2010 with our first vessel, the RV uh, Lone Ranger. We operated that for two years while we were retrofitting research vessel Falcor, which we operated for 10 years, um, going from 2010 to 2022. And in that period, we had 81 different expeditions and we hosted over a thousand international scientists. The vessel now uh, belongs to the Italian government. The Italian CNR has renamed her Gaia Blue and she's still operating for science. Um, and Research Vessel Falcor 2 has begun its life and is currently in Puerto Rico uh, doing sea trials where at least two people on this call will be heading out to Puerto Rico to join uh, next month. The work we do moving forward is going to be uh, very heavily influenced by our strategic framework. Um, this framework kind of spells out the different science that we're interested in doing uh, and it's going to be the fundamental form for proposals that come into us to have to match the kind of work that they do with the work that we are doing. Um, and in the past, during the life of Falcor, we would open the call for expressions of interest to the entire world and we would get EOIs from everywhere, um, all the ocean basins. And in evolving our program thinking, we decided that that wasn't necessarily how we wanted to go forward any longer. So with Research Vessel Falcor 2, we are announcing all the areas we're gonna be operating in. It's already been announced uh, a couple weeks ago. And when we open our proposal, our call for proposals, we'll be open to proposals coming in for any of those operating areas through any year. Um, but I'll get more into that as we go forward. Uh, diving into the strategic framework, you'll find we have an interactive website and that's what the RFID uh, code will take you to. Uh, and they dive more into the different uh, topical areas here, but this is just a, a really big picture of the type of science that we're looking to do. I would imagine that the science that anybody on this call is doing would fit very easily into any one of these areas and probably more than one. Um, on the networking session, we had somebody who was a, uh, a music artist um, and was working on developing music. Um, I thought I wanted to make sure I flagged that because we sail artists at sea with all of our cruises and we've had different people go out and produce different uh, music track scores based on the sounds of the sea and the sounds of the science that were going on. Um, the website itself is interactive and I encourage everybody to, to check out the website and to dive into the strategic framework because that's the type of science that we're going to be focusing on as we go through the different regions over the next 10 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this map was shared about two weeks ago. Um, these are the areas that we'll be operating in um, over the next decade. The order of the regions, you'll see uh, Research Vessel Falcor operated primarily in the Atlantic and Pacific, and we wanted to make sure that we took Falcor 2 to areas that hadn't necessarily been visited by us before. So a lot of this was influenced by us looking to chart new areas for Schmidt Ocean Institute. Uh, we're really excited to see the different science that comes uh, to us and that we are able to um, support uh, on Research Vessel Falcor 2. And as I said, the call for expressions of interest is coming soon. Um, but when it is, we will be open to a proposal coming into us for 2030. We'll get that reviewed alongside with the proposals that are looking to, to get work done in 2025. And we are willing to slot and schedule projects that far out 
uh, in order to support the community um, based on the feedback that we got on how we did things in the past. There are three different primary ways that uh, scientists can take part in cruises on Schmidt uh, on research vessel Falkor II. Um, the primary way is proposal submission, uh, and that for us is a two-part um, process where EOIs are the kind of light lift document where a scientist will detail the kind of work that they want to do, who they want to do it with, and where they want to go out and do it. Uh, we down select from those and invite for proposals, and those are the big picture uh, documents that explain in detail all that wants to be done by that researcher or the research group. One new addition is we are willing to accept not only written submissions, but video submissions for anybody whose <clears throat> primary language isn't necessarily English and that they feel more comfortable in verbally sharing the work that they want to do. They can submit uh, video EOIs and video for proposals to us. Um, we also have partnerships. Uh, we have partnerships with National Geographic Society, MTS and IEEE, and they, those MOUs spell out that we are willing to identify births on Research Vessel File Core 2 for ident specifically identified sailors by those societies who fit the profile of those societies as well as the work that's going on on the ship. Um, they are able to identify sailors for us um, and we will support them on Research Vessel File Core 2 also. Um, and the next slide will get a little bit more into the partnership with National Geographic Society. But I wanted to flag for everybody on the call that we have an NGS member, um, Lauren Maley. She's on the call and is able to answer any questions for folks, both in the chat. And if people have questions in the Q&A, they are welcome to ask them of her also. And then we also have bursts of opportunity where if a, if a proposal doesn't make full use of the vessel and there are one or two bursts, we'll start opening those up to the community for individual scientists to kind of raise a hand and say, I'm available here and I'm, I'm willing to go out to the ship where it is and people can get on the vessel that way also. Um, I wanted to give a couple of tips for, for a successful proposal with SOI. These are kind of the things that aren't always thought about. A lot of, a lot of detail and conversation goes into a, some of the big picture things, but there's some small things that oftentimes get overlooked. Um, number one being alignment with, in our case, a strategic framework, but any given organization's um, specific priorities. A proposal really needs to focus as closely as possible to um, the priorities of the organization that they're writing to. Um, for us, we are going to be really focused on the partnerships and the collaborations uh, for the proposals that come in to make sure that they're making available opportunities for the areas that we're operating in. We don't want just scientists from one nation to travel to another and get their work done and head home. We're going to be looking very closely at how they are partnering with the local area. Um, data collection. A lot of people give a lot of talk to it. We are going to be focusing very hard on how the data is going to be shared and accessed going forward. Um, so for us, that's going to be a major uh, point of, of flagging in the proposals that come into us. Um, and then I'm going to skip over the logistics. You, folks can read that one, but there's one I wanted to flag, and that's the diplomatic permit authorization. A lot of proposals come into us that want to operate in foreign waters, and folks don't necessarily realize how complicated it is to get permission from the different nations to get the work done. And it's not necessarily something that uh, every PI needs to think about uh, and, and put a lot of time and thought into, but it is something that when a proposal is supported with us and with anybody doing ship operations, it's something that's going to get flagged and, and going to have to get a lot of attention to get that secured. Um, and then with funding, SOI does not support uh, uh, scientist salaries. So you're going to have to be able to identify where you're going to get your own costs funded. And if there's additional equipment, um, how that's going to be obtained. We are willing to support the provisioning of robotic systems and other uh, ROVs beyond Sebastian or AUVs, if that is something that's of interest to a party. But smaller levels of equipment, that's going to be on the PI to identify. Um, and getting into funding, there is a world of funding out there. And it's not just in the US or any major uh, first world nation. There's lots of different places and a lot of different funders out there. And I just wanted to put a few different names out there um, for folks to think about and to consider putting applications in if the work that they're doing is in line with the kind of work that you might be doing and not just the NSFs and the NOAAs of the world. A lot of these folks will do small pot funding the partnership with National Geographic, in, for example, 
is looking to find explorers and support them up to $20,000 to get their work done. And we have National Geographic explorers being lined up now who will be going out on Falcor 2 in 2023 through this partnership. And I would be ha I'm happy to share that some of those are Cobra folks. Um, and I thought with the last couple of minutes I have, um, I'm actually going to speed up a little bit. Um, I thought folks might be interested in getting a chance to board Research Vessel File Core 2. And I know only a couple of folks here are going to get that opportunity in the near future. But for anybody else who's interested, I will take a quick virtual tour of the vessel based on stuff I just got approved to share. We um, crafted a 3D video, and that's what you're looking at here coming in from the aft deck is the Hanger of Research Vessel Falcor and Sebastian there. Uh, it doesn't want to go full screen for me. Anyway, and you're now looking at the dirty wet lab on the port side of the vessel. We have over 200 square meters of lab space, and we're going to move from the aft towards the forward part of the ship uh, for this part. Here you have the dirty wet lab where the CTD and water props can get processed in a clean area. The grating there is double layered so that your feet don't get wet. The water will go straight through the grating and out the ship. Moving forward, we get to the hydro lab where you step one step in and you still have kind of wet, dirty-ish area to process samples and get them moved in. Across from that is the robotics lab, which is uh, dedicated directly to robotics support. Behind that is the mission control room with space for a dozen, uh, a dozen or more scientists to be able to support the ROV and the operations going on there. Uh, folks can come in and watch it, the ROV or whatever assets in the water. There's controllable areas, multiple controllable areas for that work. Across from that is the wet lab with multiple sinks, freezers, uh, refrigerator, ice maker. Uh, I think there are two fume hoods in here uh, to support the work. Moving across from that is the computer electronics lab where folks will be having all their laptops set up and have access to power uh, in any flavor in any uh, US and uh, UK um, power. And I wanted to point out here, we intentionally uh, exposed power lines and cabling because we thought it would be interesting for folks to see how the work gets run through the ship. Here is the uh, main lab with uh, a ton of space, refrigerator, freezers, um, configurable for whatever kind of science is going to go on on the ship. And behind that is the seawater lab with access to um, uh, over a dozen different flavors of, of water, both fresh, fr cold, um, there's a uh, marine, there's uh, water that's had the uh, marine plastics pulled out of it. And then moving on to the other areas of the ship, uh, beyond the labs, there's conference room space for um, folks to maintain classes and do video calls or whatever else, whatever meetings might need to take place on the ship. There are, are multiple communal spaces that have been thought through. Uh, this, is, this area is just across from the dining area, so folks will likely be eating here. There's multiple communal spaces outside as well with two outdoor levels for, for, for people to get together and work. Here's one angle on the dining area. There's kind of another angle going in the opposite direction with more tabling. Uh, and this is just one example of a bunk space. Um, there are multiple bunks throughout the ship. We are looking at when the ship is fully operational, offering up to 40 different bunks uh, for, for science proposals uh, on the ship. And that is where I will end. And I've got, I think, two minutes for, for questions. Oh, we've got more time than that. Oh, okay. We're good. <laughs> I was I was reading the timer on my thing. Okay, perfect. That was great. I'm heading down the ship in a couple of weeks. I'm so excited. I'm gonna go meditate somewhere <laughs> beautiful somewhere. Yeah. All right. Uh, questions for Leonard? You can. Uh, Rosalind, you can help me because my view is looking weird. You can raise your hand. You can put it in the chat. There. Are, Jonathan. Hi, um, this is Jonathan. I'm just going to ask a question. So when you guys do do your research, do you guys publish it on a, a web page or is it going to be like a paid like subscription to access the information? Okay, so that, that I'm going to answer that on a couple of different levels. When the research is being done live, we live stream all the dives on the vessel. We strongly encourage and re request that the science party do a lot of work in sharing their work um, live on the ship through blogs, through SOI's blog, through their own personal blogs. We do a lot of, uh, we will be sailing multimedia correspondence with all our vessels. We have dedicated berths for them and they will be doing kind of higher level video production uh, that will be going out off the ship 
if it's done and ready fast enough, it'll be going out while the cruise is going on. If not, it'll be going off uh, shortly thereafter. And then, yeah, I think that covers all the, the immediate kind of sharing of, of the, the science live. But one other thing I'd flag for a lot of the folks here on the call, um, when you publish your work, a lot of times work gets published in non-open access journals. For scientists who find their work in non-open access journals, we are willing to pay the cost to take their scientific work that's done on Falcor and make that open access for them. I have taken advantage of that many times. So I think <laughs> it's a great thing that you guys do. It's really, really helpful. Um, yeah, that was a really good question. Uh, Jesse? Hey, um, really interesting. I kind of want to lift on the ship now. I was wondering whether um, you could tell us a little bit more about the space on the ship. So obviously I'm already like chatting with a friend about potential ideas. Um, I'm really interested in the midwater, so I would want to have like mock nest systems, ROV systems, but there might also be more interest in benthic works, which all will take lots of space potentially. So is that possible? Yes, that is absolutely possible. That is a lot that is the kind of work we've supported in the past. Um mock nest, uh a mock nest can be brought out. We have an A frame, we have uh J frame. Um yeah, we can certainly support mock nest work. Um ROV Sebastian has done midwater work in the past. We um had uh Dr. Kakani Katija and I'm blanking on the other researcher, and they um field tested a rotating dodecahedron, a rotated actuator dodecahedron, a rad sampler that would close around midwater animals. And they had a laser scanner to, to scan the animals and to get um, uh, 3D imagery of the work uh, of the animals themselves. That is absolutely the kind of science that we're happy to, to entertain. Um, so yeah, please bring that on. Thank you. Uh, is, Elva had a question in the chat, uh, which was, are you visiting the, oh, oh, there you are. Do you want to ask the question? Yeah, sure. Uh, I was wondering if you, um, 2023, it says uh, the Atlantic, but then you're crossing, I suppose, through Panama? Yes, that's or correct. To, to the Pacific. And I was wondering if you're going to be working in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, including Mexico. For next year, yes. Uh, we'll be- Oh, it's this year. It says oh, yes, that's right. This is 2023. <laughs> yes, all of 2023 is is slated and, and spelled out based primarily on the projects that were not supported on research vessel Falcor when it was retired. Uh, we're going to be uh, doing a couple of cruises off Galapagos. Um, Beth is leading two legs worth of work uh, next year, and then the first time frame that we don't have spelled out is early 2024, and then onward. Okay. Thank you. If, if you have ideas and if, if please let us know um, where yeah. there's space for collaborating with the scientists who are already going out, um, that sort of thing, conversations can be had, but it won't yeah, be open exactly. for proposals. Um, I am meeting with colleagues in Costa Rica and in three weeks, and we will be discussing about cruises and things like that. So um, that, that, that could be a possibility at the end of the year or early 2024. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, Christian? Again, we have it with the name. Thank you very much. We had that already in the breakout session. Um, hi, Leonard. I would have a question in terms of uh, students, because, um, for example, in the breakout sessions, we, we were students there, and in some countries can be pretty difficult and challenging to get ship time, just hands-on experience as a student, which, of course, is a necessary step before you start planning your own um, excursions and, and projects. So is there any chance for students or um, general internationals to join cruises of the Falcon? If so, whom to contact and which way? Or is there a project plan online or something like that? Yep. So yes, there are lots of opportunities for students. Excuse me, please. Um, we had a student opportunities program specifically targeted at supporting those bursts of opportunities when they popped up. I imagine we will reformat that in some way for specific students to raise their hand and say, I'd like to find an opportunity on this cruise that you have on the website. If there's birthing, please let me know kind of a offering. We will be expecting our um, PIs to be asking for births for students. Um, that's kind of just a normal process that we get students 
through the, the application process. But also one piece that I didn't dive into deeply is I mentioned that we are going to be doing this in a two phase, the proposal review be a two phase proposal review process with the EOIs and the full proposals. What I didn't dive into, because it's a little bit in the weeds, but we are somewhat concerned about how we're going to fill the ship with the full proposals. And we don't want to run the risk of having problems where we have three different full proposal PIs that have all been told yes. And we're telling them after they've been told yes, now we're going to have to put you all on the ship together, figure out how this is going to work. And what we're thinking to do to smooth that process out is that the EOI phase instead say that any proposals that don't make full use of the ship, we're going to start talking about how this EOI that we received could work with this EOI that we received and put those um, PIs in touch with one another so that they can come together and create a full proposal from those EOIs. And if we've had many students write EOIs to us. So if there are student EOIs that come in that we think might match with another full proposal EOI, there's an opportunity for us to, us being SOI, to do that marriage but for the full proposal to, to get written to us that way. Does that make sense? Did that get to your question? If you could help me, what exactly is an EOI? Expression, so of, in, expression of interest. And those are the okay, small okay. documents for us that, that spell okay. out. So PR also together. students could uh, send something like that over to you and then you could perfectly match those with interest. Okay, thank you. That's really yeah. helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah. And the I, I'll give some credit where credit is due. Uh, the idea to do the matchmaking came from somebody on this call who I greatly appreciate for that for that uh, for that idea. Um, and we had one before I, Nurse, I see your hands up, but there was one question that came in over chat that I just wanted to answer really quickly about proposal success rate. Uh, really, really short answer is roughly 30% at the EOI phase and then roughly 30% at the full proposal stage based on how we did things with Falcor uh, previously. What that'll look like with Falcor 2, that is still yet to be determined because we don't know what the pro proposal pressure is going to be when we first open the call. Nurse, I will put it over to you. Hey there. Thank you so much, Leonard. That was wonderful to see that and really appreciated. Uh, I was just thinking in terms of your your map, you know, in, in the geography and going into, um, is there capacity to go into the subantarctic and Antarctic, or is that not necessarily covered in the current planning? No, that is absolutely current in the current planning. Falcor was rated, we would go, I think it was 50 degrees north-south uh, was the max we told PIs. We're looking at pushing that. It is ice strengthened, not ice hardened. So we're looking at being able to handle uh, light ice, but it is by no means an mm -hmm. icebreaker. So depending on how far uh, into to ice conditions you're looking to go, it can be supported on Falcor too. Okay, and I was just wondering as well in terms of time frames, like how much ship time are people expected to be able to put in for an, a proposal as well? Perfect timing. That question also came in over chat. Um, <laughs> Maximum endurance, I think we're quoting 60 days. Um, the ship can stay out okay. for a very long time. I will, I will be surprised if PIs put in for that long, but it is, we, we will be opening it up for that long. And then I, that, okay. I think there was a birthing question. During our shakedown year, this current year, we're trying to keep birthing at about 20 or so um, science party. But when the full proposal call goes out, it'll be a 40, 40 births for the science party. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay, so now you guys all know, Leonard, I think all of these questions have been answered now. Oh, except uh, Andrea's. Are there opportunities for educators who are working with specific science topics to join an expedition? We have not had a, an expedator, uh, educator at sea offering specifically. Um, if an educator did want to sail, I would recommend putting in an EOI about the kind of work you would want to do. And that was the sort of thing I would marry with a full proposal from a Beth or a Julie who said, I want to use Falcor in 2027. I would see that there's a there might be a, a match here that I can make. Um, that's the sort of way that that could easily be handled. Um, but yeah, we have not had an educator specific program in the past. Great. Well, thanks so much, Leonard. Um, I'm looking forward to to seeing this thing and 
in real in real life. Very exciting. We wish you guys so much success. Uh, and now I'm going to hand it off to Dan Wagner, who leads the science program for Ocean Exploration Trust. So over to you, Dan. Thank you, Julie. Can you confirm my slides are up and you can hear me? Yeah, looks good. Wonderful. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much for the inv invitation to present. So my name is Daniel Wagner. I'm the chief scientist for the Ocean Exploration Trust. Uh, and today I'm just going to provide a little bit of an overview of our general mission and priorities, and then uh, an overview of our expedition that is about to start, uh, our season that's about to start here a couple months from, from today. Uh, but just to set the stage, uh, you guys all know that you know, the ocean is largely unexplored. We have better maps of many planets in the solar system that we have of our, our own planet. Uh, and that's really what provides the backstage and the inspiration for what we do. Uh, so the Ocean Exploration Trust, we're fully dedicated to exploring the ocean, to seek out new discoveries and pushing the boundaries of technological innovation, education and outreach. Uh, so we are really about generating knowledge and then disseminating that knowledge to the public at large. Uh, so we own and operate the exploration vessel Nautilus. Uh, this is a 224 foot uh, research vessel uh, that is equipped with various exploration technologies. Um, we ho host a suite of uh, acoustic sonars to map the seafloor. Uh, and these are pretty much run on, on almost every one of our expeditions, because most of the places we go are, are pretty much uncharted. Uh, and uh, that mapping data has been very uh, valuable to setting up the, the second thing, uh, what we're more known for, which is our remotely operated vehicles. Uh, we own uh, four of them, uh, and these are just wonderful uh, Swiss Army type tools. So uh, our remotely operated vehicles can be customized depending on the mission. Uh, best known for our uh, high resolution cameras that are we transmit our data in real time, uh, but they also have a suite of different environmental sensors, grabbers, samplers, uh, and can really be customized um, on the fly. So it's, uh, on some missions, we'll, we'll actually change some of the equipment between dives uh, and customize the mission that way. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the video from the remotely operated vehicles is uh, is shared broadly, so that's transmitted to the ship. Uh, and then because we have a that, that white dome there in the back uh, that allows us to have high bandwidth internet, uh, so on each and every one of our expeditions, uh, we have 24-7 live streams. So for those cruises where we have our remotely operated vehicles, uh, anyone with an internet connection is able to see what's happening uh, on the bottom of the seafloor. And then there's a whole bunch of other cameras throughout the ship. Uh, so yeah, anyone can kind of see what's happening uh, on the ship in real time. Uh, this is a, a really wonderful tool uh, for, for science. Uh, so um, it opens up the door much more broadly than what we can accommodate on the ship. So we have berths for about uh, 50 people, and about 30 of those are, are scientists, engineers, and the, the primary mission personnel. Uh, but it is typical that on many of our expeditions, we have 100 or more scientists ashore uh, that participate from either their home, uh, from their computer laptop, or from these exploration command centers uh, where scientists gather and, and are basically able to uh, follow along in real time, send communications to ship, uh, and help with interpretations, help with uh, guiding where we go and what we do. Uh, but in addition to that, that's also a tremendous uh, tool for education and outreach. Uh, so as I said, the live streams are uh, shared with anyone. Uh, and uh, there's actually another uh, thing that we do uh, pretty routinely, and anyone can sign up for this, is what we call our ship to shore interactions. So you can go through our website and sign up if you have a captive audience somewhere, if you're a teacher, educator, um, TA, what have you, and, and you want to have an interaction with a scientist uh, on the ship and, and kind of communicate, you can set up these 30 to 60 minutes uh, interactions and, and kind of get a, a better feel of, of what's happening on, on our missions. So in terms of our program priorities, uh, so for this coming uh, year, so our, our work is primarily funded through NOAA Ocean Exploration, uh, through the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, that the Ocean Exploration Trust is a proud member, along with five other organizations. 
Uh, and so we're really an, an extension of NOAA ocean exploration. So it's about mapping and exploring um, uncharacterized areas in the Central and Eastern Pacific. Uh, and it's also about integrating emerging technologies. Uh, so when you go to a remote place uh, and take a ship, uh, you know, you're kind of limited to that ship. So we're trying to integrate more and more uh, technology so you can deploy them hopefully uh, in simultaneously and then double or triple the, the footprint of what you can explore. So that's a big part of our uh, explorations. Uh, then we're also tight, uh, closely tied to the management needs of the areas that we're working. Uh, so uh, for these next couple of years, uh, we're working in, in areas where we have very large marine protected areas and other marine managed areas. Uh, so trying to collect scientific information that directly address the management needs in these areas. Uh, and then that fourth bullet point is, is really important to what we do. We are a global program. We've been now close to celebrating 15 years of existence and have been uh, all around the world. And uh, uh, our, our Nautilus core of exploration come from every corner of the world. Uh, but in addition to be global, we also want to be locally relevant and culturally appropriate. So before our missions, we try to work with communities in the areas we're working to make sure that the, the science we do and the way we do it is relevant to the places that we're working in. Uh, and last year, I already talked about our life streams. So we, we try to use uh, what we do uh, to share with the, with the public, to raise awareness about these ecosystems and places that most people will not get to visit uh, in their own lifetimes and use that as, a, as an inspiration to motivate and inspire the next generation of ocean explorers. Uh, and the last bullet point there, uh, this is also really a big part uh, for our funders as well as for us. Uh, so wherever it's appropriate, we try to publicly uh, make available all of our data. Uh, so uh, most of our, uh, our data, our mapping data, or video data, unless there's a, a specific reason not to because of uh, regulations, uh, we put these on, on various publicly accessible uh, sources. So for those of you who are students, there's really a, 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 a big treasure chest there of data that can be mined for various uh, projects. So in terms of looking ahead, um, uh, we are about to uh, release here uh, uh, our season schedule. And actually just yesterday, we kind of at, uh, finalized in terms of the, the general lineup of the expeditions where we'll be going. Uh, so as I mentioned, we'll be working in the Central and Eastern Pacific, uh, working in places where there are uh, large marine managed areas. Um, and uh, so our expedition season is going to start this April uh, with a couple of shakedown uh, operations. So this is really at the beginning of the season, uh, really just about doing sea trials and making sure that our systems are, are ready to go. These are where we don't do live streaming or any education and outreach because it's really about just testing and making sure that we're ready. Uh, but then uh, in May, uh, we'll really formally start our expedition season uh, with an uh, expedition to uh, Kingman and Palmyra, part of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. Uh, after that, we'll head to British Columbia, so across the entire Pacific to support uh, several expeditions funded by Ocean Networks Canada to support their cabled array system there of, of British Columbia. Uh, and then after that, uh, in late July, we'll be returning to Central Pacific, where we'll have expeditions to Janssen Atoll uh, using remotely operated vehicles and an unsurfaced, uh, uncrewed surface vehicle. Uh, then a series of other expeditions in the main uh, and northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Uh, and yeah, this should be posted on our website uh, pretty soon with, with a bit more specific information. So I mentioned that we're really known about for, for these various systems. So our C4 mapping sonars, our remotely operated vehicles, and our telepresence. And this is really what we're, we're known for. Uh, but I also mentioned that in addition to that, a big part of our mission here driving what we do um, is testing and integrating uh, emergent exploration technologies. Uh, and in particular, those that are being developed by our partners of the NOAA Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. Uh, so these are just a few of the technologies that will be uh, integrated and tested uh, this coming year. Uh, this red vehicle there on the top right, that is uncrewed surface vehicle DRIX uh, by the University of New Hampshire. Uh, we've been uh, uh, 
integrating that over the last season and we'll continue to do that. That, uh, that basically acts as a second ship. Uh, so that has uh, a multi-beam sonar and various other sensors, uh, but it actually can also act as a second mothership if you want, that you then can communicate with other vehicles. And we'll do that on our technology demonstration cruise where DRIX will be launched in tandem with uh, this uh, Midwater uh, robot, the autonomous vehicle um, uh, Mesobot by our colleagues at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Uh, we'll also be working with uh, our colleagues at the University of Rhode Island to deploy this uh, deep autonomous profiler. Uh, so this is a, a piece of equipment designed around a standard Niskin uh, carousel. So collecting CTD data, but uh, can do a few other things, uh, including collecting video data, uh, beta trap information, uh, a whole bunch of things. Uh, and then just a few others, a HADL profiler will be deploying in Hawaii. Uh, that's uh, work by Jeff Drazen's group at the University of Hawaii. Uh, and then the bottom here, uh, one new uh, suite of technology that will actually be, be standard on all of our expeditions moving forward is we just installed successfully a month ago, uh, a midwater sonar and ADCP. Uh, so that data will also be routinely collected on our cruises and then publicly archived. Uh, and two very exciting uh, other pieces of equipment that are be integrated. One here is a um, Raman spectrometer that will be deployed on a cruise to Palmyra Atoll. So this is uh, technology that was designed really for outer space exploration. So te for testing outer bodies and moons on Saturn and Jupiter, uh, we'll be integrating this on our ROV. Uh, and basically what this uh, instrument does, it, it gives you information about the, the composition of materials without having to collect them. Uh, so optically, uh, and then last but certainly not least, uh, we'll be doing some nearshore mapping uh, and some of the remote atolls using a, a new mapping system developed by partners at the University of Miami. Uh, so these are uh, MIDAR, so multispectral imaging that allows you to get really, really fine resolution maps of, of um, of, of, of shallow water systems. So it's, it's really limited to about 60 meters, but some of the places that we've been, we'll be operating, uh, there's not maps of, of those uh, areas. Just wanna spend a couple of minutes talking about the plethora of education and outreach uh, opportunities that exist on every one of our expeditions. Uh, you can visit our website and there's a tab there for education and outreach. Uh, so this is really a big part of our core mission, as I mentioned. So we're are about exploring, but we're also about sharing that experience with the public at large. Uh, so we have on every one of our expeditions, uh, sign engineering internships. So these are paid uh, opportunities for student interns at the undergraduate, uh, graduate, and, and recently graduate level, uh, where student interns sail on our expeditions and participate on various um, um, and various roles. Uh, the, the last uh, cohort just closed the applications in December, but I can also share that there will be a mapping uh, student internship that will be opening in the next couple of weeks. So for our mapping only cruises, uh, stay tuned. There will be an announcement and uh, uh, people can apply uh, to sail on our expeditions as mapping interns. We also have our science communication fellowships. So these are uh, paid fellowships for professional educators to sail on our expeditions uh, and help us with the translation of the science and bringing those uh, stories to the public at large. Uh, they help us with narrations of the live stream and narr narrating those conversations that you see when you're here, uh, when you tune in live. Uh, but they also develop uh, materials that are then fairly accessible to various sources talked about our life interactions, a whole suite of other sources. Uh, if you get one thing out of the, uh, this talk, uh, just uh, I encourage you all to take a look at our website, uh, notuslife.org. Uh, there's a whole suite of uh, resources, uh, both for scientists, educators, or just uh, curious deep sea fans uh, uh, for all of you to, to share along. Uh, and uh, if you uh, visit our website um, when we are uh, doing work and we're currently uh, uh, not out, but as I mentioned, our season really will start in mid-May. Uh, if you go to our landing page, uh, that basically will, will give you something like this. 
it will, you'll be able to see exactly what's happening on the ship uh, with some information of where we are and, and what you're seeing. Um, and that is available to anyone with an internet connection. Uh, so anyone can uh, can kind of share and kind of see what's what's happening. Uh, but for those of you who are scientists that actually want to get uh, more involved and want to actually participate in helping plan and execute these missions, we have our Scientists Ashore program. Uh, so these are open for most of our uh, expeditions. Uh, these are uh, basically um, a series of tools uh, that you'll get access to. So for those that have uh, a signed in interest that is compatible with the expedition, uh, you'll be able to participate as scientists ashore. Basically, what this will give you is, is regular updates, email updates on what's happening and, and the upcoming plans. Uh, and then also we'll give you a series of tools to be able to have a two-way communication. So not just listening on what's happening, but actually talking to the ship uh, and helping kind of actively um, guide. Uh, and that will give you access to real-time uh, data streams in addition to video, uh, a, a portal that'll, that'll see a lot more. Uh, and I don't have enough time to go into this in detail, but I just wanted to encourage those that want to learn more and are maybe interested to participate as scientists ashore we have a webinar a week from tomorrow, and I'll, I'll paste the link here for, for you to register into the, into the chat uh, momentarily. And last, uh, public data. Uh, so we do our best or try our best to, to really make our, uh, our, our experiences available to, to, to the public at large. But uh, uh, another part is, is we try to make our data open, openly accessible. Uh, so you know, most of our data ends up in, uh, in these various uh, publicly available uh, repositories uh, where you know, people can basically download it and then use it for their own research. That includes the, the, the physical samples that are collected um, and, and various other things. So again, that's all linked in our website. There's a science tab there that will get you basically to each one of these repositories and then you can, uh, can basically go to the to the level of requesting individual uh, data sets. Uh, and this is really a, a, important because it, it basically makes sure that the data we collect uh, lives in in perpetuity and hopefully uh, scientists can, uh, can then, because uh, a lot of times the big discoveries happen years after. Uh, so yeah, I really encourage folks, especially students that are looking for projects, there's a, there's a treasure chest of data for you to all sift through. Uh, and with that, I mentioned our website, uh, and if I have time, I'll take uh, questions, and I'll place that uh, link here in the chat for the uh, Scientists Ashore uh, webinar next week. Uh, so thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, hey, everybody, I'm filling in for Julie. She had to step out, um, but I'll happy to field questions uh, for Dan about Ocean Exploration Trust. Um, and thank you so much for providing the link for everybody to join um, the uh, expedition webinar next week. That sounds great. Um, there's so many expeditions I want to go on. <laughs> I need to clone myself. Are there questions for Dan? Please feel free to raise your hand or uh, type them into the chat. Yeah, Jonathan, please go ahead. Hey, Dan, uh, one of my questions is, is for this season, you guys are planning to work near Hawaii in the areas like that. Um, are you guys just going to be uh, mapping out new areas of like formed land or is it more previous land that was there before, uh, prior? So excellent question. Well, there's there's actually five separate expeditions that will be in the vicinity of the, the of the Hawaiian Islands in terms of, yeah, there's uh, there is a mapping effort that is completely unmapped area. There'll be one of these technology demonstration uh, expeditions where it's you know, going over an area that has been surveyed before, but it's more about uh, testing and, and looking how these different technologies work one up one another. Uh, we have an ROV expedition out to the Papahanaumokuakea Kea Marine National Monument to the, the northern extent. Um, yeah, so they, they all come in different flavors. Uh, and I would say they're either mapping and characterizing areas that haven't been surveyed on or, or the, the, the technology demonstration. Thank you. Dan, I have a question um, that maybe other audience members have. If someone had an idea for where the Nautilus might be good to serve its mission, 
how would someone reach out to you and talk to you about like, would the Nautilus ever go there? Could we organize a cruise there? Are you going there? Can I go? Uh, how does someone get involved like that? Yeah, thanks, Beth. Excellent question. So um, um, we do have a, a couple of things. So in, in terms of just um, deciding the, the broad geographies uh, where we go. So that's that's really, um, in, in most cases, it's just by our sponsors that, that fund individual expeditions. Uh, luckily, most, if not all of our sponsors are really about involving the community and involving scientists. Uh, and so once we have kind of the, the geography uh, decided of where the general area will be working in the next year or two, uh, we released these call for science input, and there was one released uh, last December to kind of where, where people then can um, uh, specify individual areas to be mapped, seamounts or other areas to be dove on, individual samples to be collected, um, and um, and just kind of raise their hand and saying, I'm a, I'm a scientist with this expertise, I'd like to participate. Um, in addition to that, uh, you can also just uh, email us if there's kind of general ideas about to collab collaborate. And I'll put the, the general uh, generic email here in the chat. So it's just science at oet.org. So if you have anything related to science and ideas, um, in, there's that. Um, now, in terms of uh, if people are extremely uh, innovative or so. So we have in some cases kind of collaborated on proposal writing to uh, track funding. And then, uh, uh, you know, that's another opportunity. Uh, so really the, the sky is the limit, but I, I would say probably in the in the shorter term and the you know, one to two year time frame, uh, the best way is to just keep in touch and know where the general area where we're going uh, and then make sure that if you have areas that you think are of value to map, dive on or do other science to, to let us know early. Great. Another question that folks might have, uh, those internships that you mentioned and the other opportunities you mentioned for folks to be able to sail with Nautilus, are those open to people all over the world? Are they uh, any, any restrictions on that? So yeah, that, that's a that's a really good question. Uh, so there are in, in some restrictions in terms of um, yeah where we are. Uh, so we are not a U.S. flagged vessel. So we're uh, and so depending on the areas we're working, there might be visa restrictions. In, in some cases, we might have to be limited to, to U.S. and ca uh, Canadian um, nationals. But yeah, under under respective call for proposals, that that will be clearly specified. Uh, for this year and this, this upcoming mapping internship that I mentioned, uh, it, it, there are restrictions in terms of because these are paid positions uh, that they have to be basically have a work authorization um, to work in the United States for us to open them. Uh, but yeah, it, it really depends where we're working, what ports we're using. Uh, and, and so it's, it, it's, yeah, it's open, but I'd say like in the next year or so, there will be restrictions, unfortunately, for, for people that have a, a work permit to, to work in the United States. But the scientist ashore can be from anywhere, correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Thank, thanks for flagging that. So yeah, absolutely zero restrictions in terms of where, and, and we highly encourage yeah wide participation there. It's just, yeah, for the paid positions that come on, on, on shore, um, on, on the ship, sorry. Great. Other questions for Dan? I have sort of a follow-up to that. Um, I guess I, I'm a PhD student and a lot of your internships seem kind of geared towards people with no cruise experience, but I've worked like in the um, Hawaiian National Monument a fair bit, um, but I still just as a PhD student had I guess, imposter syndrome with the community call. Um, so I guess, what level of expertise are you kind of looking for to get involved? So yeah, e excellent question. So yeah, two different things. So in terms of like the scientists ashore. So um, now we, we try to keep those to basically folks that have uh, an expertise that is related uh, to our mission. But that can be students as well, uh, especially if you have you know, a project that is related uh, to what we're doing. 
um, and um, so yeah, that that is basically open to, to you know you don't have to be a, a PhD working as a professor somewhere to be a scientist ashore. Um, so just uh, you know something to contribute um, in terms of the the internships of of sailing. Um, you know, right now uh, they're mostly geared to, as I mentioned, you know, student interns. So that's either undergraduate, graduate, or recent graduates. Um, so that's at that level. So not yet at the postdoc level. Um, and then the educators is really geared to, you know, people that are professional educators that work as teachers. Um, but we are trying to expand these capabilities too, and, and actually look at perhaps doing some of these internships, not just on the ship, but bringing them on shore and, and seeing if we can involve more people. Uh, yeah, because there's there's a tr tremendous demand for what you're, you're, you're raising there. Dan, there's a few questions for you in the chat. Um, I see that Leonard hopped in to answer one from Frank about, when Nautilus partners with other programs like Schmidt <laughs> to um, maybe do multi multi vessel expeditions, um, and um, is there appetite or opportunity for kind of collaborating cross vessels for studying some topics? Is that something that Nautilus does? Uh, it has, and uh, it, ha it has in the past, and will continue to do so. So the, the probably best. Uh, Example for that was the capstone effort. That was a closely uh, coordinated effort between you know, the then Falcor, uh, Nautilus, and the Oceanus Explorer. Um, I mentioned the Ocean Ex Exploration, NOAA Ocean Exploration, that, that runs the Oceanus Explorer, funds a lot of our work. So we're we're really trying to align our efforts to also feed into their mission. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think, as I said, we're about ocean exploration. So we we want to make sure that where we go, it, it's really about exploration, that we don't duplicate efforts. And, and that a big part of that is coordinating with the many other great programs that are out there. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I think there's tremendous value in terms of doing those coordinated efforts, mostly in terms of, you know, that's where you can really start making uh, tremendous gains in terms of the public eye and, and raising some of these issues is, is when we're all uh, singing to the same tune. Uh, there's also a question in the chat from Thomas Shigeri, I think. Uh, in your map of the upcoming expeditions, and if you wanna bring that up, go, go ahead. Um, was there an upcoming cruise to the Mariana region? And if so, what were the plans for that? So yeah, good question. Um, no, we do not. So ne next, so 2023, uh, that's uh, now you know, finalized and will be shared on our website there sh shortly. So we'll basically be uh, going as, as, as west as uh, the, the Central Pacific territories. Um, and so our last one of the expeditions will be to Jarvis Atoll uh, in, uh, in the Central Pacific. Uh, and we're still finalizing where that cruise will end, uh, but it likely will end in Samoa. Uh, and the reason for that being is that in 2024, uh, we'll start our uh, field season in, in Samoa um, and in American Samoa, and then work at some of the, the territories that are more to the West. Uh, and we can't, uh, I can't yet uh, say exactly what it looked like, but it's likely that that last expedition of 2024 will end in Guam or Saipan. So work in the Marianas is, is more than likely. There's a lot of interest by our partners to go to that area for, for obvious reasons. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of the, the, the plan is 2023 really focus on the Central and Eastern Pacific, 2024 then start shifting towards the West and, and uh, between basically uh, American Samoa and Guam. Great. Well, hopefully Thomas will get in touch with you if they're interested in a uh, expedition there. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you both so much for sharing uh, the exciting details about ocean exploration and how people can get involved. We'll make sure to get a copy of this posted to the COBRA website. So if you missed some details or want to revisit that awesome 3D tour of uh, the Falcor 2, you can uh, see all the details there. Um, a reminder to everybody that our next webinar is in one month on March 7th. 
We'll be uh, featuring Dr. Diva Aman and Henna Lilly, who will be speaking to us about kind of the latest status of where deep sea mining um, science and policy making is uh, in the lead up to the next uh, session of the International Seabed Authority, where negotiations will continue about potential mining in uh, international water. So please join us for that. Rosalyn will send us the details about how to get registered. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, Rosalyn will also be posting and has already posted a survey in the chat. We welcome everyone to please take a moment to just let us know what you like about these webinars, what you would like to see in the future. Um, you can always email us too at cobra at bigelow.org. If you have suggestions for webinar topics, um, or if you have any questions about what COBRA is up to, um, we'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, everybody.